Until the beginning of the 20th century and the discovery of flight, man's horizon was so limited, both by the curvature of the earth and his own short-sightedness, that he failed to see himself as a major force at work on his environment. What he did to the earth was expedient and local, but its additive effect was devastating. Today, more than two million acres of land in this country lie derelict and disfigured, riddled with abandoned mines, running blood red with ruined rivers, gouged and gashed by man-made cliffs and craters, littered with the skeletons of shacks and machinery, and piled high with stark and sterile banks of slag and spoil and debris. Strip mining shocks the sensibilities, not so much by what man has done, but by the sheer magnitude of his accomplishments. Working with machinery so massive as to defy the imagination, he has literally moved mountains, drastically reshaping the surface of the earth in his constant quest for the coal that lies buried beneath it. Stated in its simplest terms, strip mining consists of nothing more than removing the topsoil, rocks, and other strata that cover the coal deposits in order to extract them. It is safe, cheap, and far faster than any other method of coal mining now known. But its effects can be complex, costly, and long-lasting. In the past, and in some instances even now, the coal industry's preoccupation with short-term gains too frequently has ignored the long-term social and ecological costs involved. The silted streams, the acid-laden lakes and rivers, and the barren, treeless wastelands devoid of wildlife or further economic potential. Stuart Udall, former U.S. Secretary of the Interior. Well, of course, the uh, whole history of coal mining in this country is a rather sad story of lack of any control or regulation and of lack of any conscience on the part of the industry until very recently. And as someone said, uh, in those parts of the country that were fortunate to have coal, when you look at the long haul, coal has been a curse. Coal is an extractive industry, and like all extractive industries, once the the uh, mineral or product is mined, uh, the values are gone, and the industry usually walks away, and and uh, you're confronted then with the long haul of what people do with what is left. This is precisely the question now confronting Perry County, Ohio, an area which faces a twofold dilemma. On one hand, decimation of fully one-fifth of its land area, most of it mined before any laws governing reclamation were in existence. And on the other, a steadily declining economy. Here, employment in the coal mines has dwindled from an all-time high of 2,400 in 1947 to less than 500 today, and the total payroll to half of what it was 20 years ago. But the immediate gain, of course, is uh, the coal miners do enjoy a, uh, a good salary today and other benefits, uh, and this does solve an immediate uh, economic problem here in Perry County. However, in the long run, they do leave the land area, uh, so to speak, in the present uh, shape it's in forever. The uh, strip mining in Perry County has been here since before World War I and has continued since that time. We now have uh, in Perry County approximately 52,000 acres stripped of a total area uh, countywide of 262,000 acres. Fifth has uh, been strip mined and uh, can't be used for farming, uh, uh, it can't be used uh, to build houses on. It's absolutely worthless uh, for all time to come. In Perry County and in many other parts of the country where strip mining is practiced, the problems are not limited to the desecration of the landscape. In many cases, property damage and human health hazards are also byproducts of careless mining. For instance, in the village of Corning, they have had a uh, several uh, thousand tons of coal that's been stored there for some 40 or 50 years and suddenly caught on fire about two years ago. This has been burning constantly 
uh, causing all kinds of problems to the residents. They can't find anybody that's actually responsible. It's really hard on the health. I have asthma anyway from working in the mines and then on them damp days when it's coming this way, boy, it really works on that. That's what's killed all those trees right there now. A couple years ago, they were just green as could be. Nobody seems to want to do anything about it, though. I've went around town here and took, got all, all signatures from everybody and, and sent it in the Governor Rose and got a, a reply back that I should see the uh, air pollution. And so we uh, wrote to them and they wrote back and said it cost too much money. So I don't guess they're going to do anything about it. Well, they have made no effort, none whatsoever. Uh, other problems uh, in uh, Pleasant Township where the, uh, the uh, continuous operation of coal mines 24 hours a day on this conveyor system, uh, many people feel that uh, there is an air pollution problem that uh, they, they can't seem to uh, keep out of their house at all by the use of uh, buying uh, storm windows and doors and even air conditioning that this these uh, coal particles are so minute that they infiltrate right through the house. This is what we've been uh, telling the county health department all these months, and they don't, they just don't do anything about it. I think they're afraid. The state gets so much money, they don't care to say anything about them. That's what I personally feel. Nothing's been done. Nothing at all. Just talk, a lot of talk. I think if they were going to solve it, I told them this, they would have done it before this, long before this. They know the solution if they wanted to do it. They have a solution to everything else, and they would have solved it before this. They just don't seem to care. It's just uh, two families that's really being hurt, and they just think, well, that's their tough luck, I guess. Are just in the wrong spot. These companies do take over uh, township highways, county roads, and sometimes it appears to us that they, they don't have a legal right to do this and where they can stop traffic at will. Uh, everybody, of course, is afraid to question the giant corporation, uh, the fact that they have uh, the uh, right to do it by the fact that they are uh, big and powerful. A dedicated exception is Roger Stortz, who has single-handedly carried on a running battle with the Peabody Coal Company since they temporarily blocked off the county road leading to his home, denying him access to his own property and making a five-mile detour necessary. It was in uh, 1962 that they first closed the road, and that is when I went and talked to the trustees and different people concerning the right for them to close the road. And uh, they told me that they had, the uh, Peabody Coal Company had the right to close the road on account of they owned on both sides of it. And uh, I went and talked to different lawyers in Perry County and they also said that they didn't think there was much I could do about it on account of Peabody being a big out, such a big outfit. I can't say the reason, but it seemed like they was buddy-buddy with somebody and it wasn't me. And that's the attitude of everybody, where they're such a big company. There is nothing you can do with them. They got more money than you got, and you just can't fight them. But I did. I went to Columbus and got a lawyer up there, and he said it. He thought I, there was something I could do about it. They didn't have any more right to close a public road than anybody else. And we filed a lawsuit against them for, for closing the road. They had to put up $1,500 bond in order to close the road in order to see it, that it got back in after they closed it. And uh, I heard a rumor from one of Peabody's men that the only reason that they put the road back in it was on account of my lawsuit, that they was figuring on forfeiting the bond instead of putting the road back in, as they said it would be cheaper to forfeit the bond than it would be to put the road back in. Despite fee titles, mineral rights certificates, and documents of ownership, we are no more than brief tenants on this planet. By exercise of choice or by careless default, we shape the legacy of our descendants.
Until quite recently in this country, land reclamation and conservation were not considered by most coal companies as either a moral obligation or an integral part of the mining cycle. It is estimated that of the three million square acres of land defiled by strip mining in the United States to date, less than one third has been reclaimed, either voluntarily or under penalty of law. Even more shocking, perhaps, is the fact that of the 42 states in which strip mining is currently carried on, only nine have any regulations whatsoever to govern mining or reclamation. Well, as you would expect, the, the coal industry has been very vigorous in uh, fighting most regulations. Uh, I think what has happened in recent years, in Kentucky notably, <clears throat> within the last two or three years, is an example of what should be done, what I'd like to see done in all parts of the country. And there they absolutely require, with what seems to be rather rigid enforcement, uh, restoration of stripped areas, the expenditure of whatever money is part of the cost of mining the coal is necessary to uh, see that uh, uh, there is restoration. And this can be done, and it won't affect the economics of coal mining either in any serious way. They claimed in Kentucky three years ago that it would uh, drive them out of the state, make, their, make coal uncompetitive. This hasn't proved to be the case. In spite of more stringent regulations in some states, strip mining production figures have risen almost constantly, as has the acreage stripped each year. In Appalachia alone, with more than three quarters of a million acres already disturbed, new land is being stripped at the rate of more than 30,000 acres per year. Ohio, which had no reclamation laws until 1948, ranks fourth behind Illinois, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania in total coal tonnage produced, but second only to Pennsylvania in total acreage stripped. Today, two-thirds of this land, much of it remaining from pre-regulation days, lies derelict and may never be reclaimed. Yet even under the new laws, which have been revised several times in recent years, some problems still exist. Well, the present law uh, in Ohio makes it, uh, well, it determines that a coal company must uh, bond each acre up to $300, and this money uh, is to be used for reclamation purposes. Uh, the biggest problem is that the coal company, many times in areas such as this, it's, it's much easier to uh, forfeit the bond than to reclaim the land. The important thing here is that the reclamation does get done regardless of whether the operator does it or whether he forfeits his bond. That's why the bond is there. Uh, reclamation is a necessity and this is why it's bonded to ensure that it gets done. This is why the state handles it the way they do. Also, it might extend this and say that this business is no different than any other. The good businessman will prevail Few coal mining companies in the country appear to have adopted a more comprehensive program of reclamation than the Ohio Power Company, whose sprawling strip mining operations span some 25,000 acres in eastern Ohio. Through careful mining practices, proper reclamation procedures, conservation of the watershed, and massive reforestation, Ohio Power has managed to convert what might have become a desolate wasteland into a pleasant and productive recreational area complete with picnic facilities, heavily stocked lakes and ponds, and experimental stands of trees and plants. Yet even this is only a temporary triumph. In the endless war between nature and technology, the land is inevitably the loser. During the next 35 years, Big Muskie, the world's largest drag line, a machine capable of devouring the landscape at the rate of 325 cubic yards in a single bite, will march across the area already reclaimed, unearthing still deeper veins of coal. Here, as elsewhere, there would appear to be a large difference between what the public can see for itself and what it is told.
they got a sign down there on the highway that says Operation Green Earth, and it shows trees and birds and wildlife. But people say that uh, that sign is sure misleading because in instead of Operation Green Earth, it's Operation Brown Earth. And that's just the way they leave it. There is a law where they're supposed to level the uh, squirrel banks back off and uh, plant trees, but Peabody hasn't did so far. They don't do near the job that the other strip mines does. In fairness, it should be pointed out that the company in question has made recognizable efforts, however minimal or perfunctory they might be, on at least a portion of its land. Their failure, if it can truly be classified a failure, has much to do with local conditions. Yet even this, in the view of experts, is something that can and must be coped with in the future. This area here is uh, a little more favorable as far as uh, reclamation opportunities concerned than some others that we have farther north, such as you've seen up there in Perry County. Uh, in that case, you have uh, a chemical condition in, with the rocks and the overburden such that uh, high quantities of acid are produced if it's left on the surface. And strip mining being as it normally is, a lot of this material does wind up being on the surface even after it's reclaimed and uh, no amount of moving it around with a bulldozer is going to change this because it's just thoroughly mixed up. Whereas if you would go about the operation uh, with the plan in mind of removing these acid uh, containing rocks and putting them over in one spot and then when you finish taking out the coal put these back in the bottom of the pit and cover, cover it up with what you took off the top which isn't as acid, why you've gone a long way towards doing a, a better job of reclamation. You're going to be able to support vegetation on the surface. I don't offhand know of any state where the law has got to this point where it's so explicit that it says you have to uh, remove the topsoil and put it in one spot and take the acid bearing materials and put them in another when you're doing the mining. But. Uh, I think it's going to get to the point where it is that way. People are going to demand it. The main things uh, that how can we get this land back to the way it was when the Indians roamed this area, and I think that this is impossible. A lot of people, though, feel that the federal government, with all its money and power, will eventually come into this area with gigantic machines and. Uh, bring it back to the way it was before. In my opinion that this can't be done. It's, uh, it's not uh, fiscally possible. Well, the, we calculated once in a strip mine study we made about two years ago what the cost would be of restoring all the stripped areas in the United States. As I recall it, uh, it was a very big cost, something like two billion dollars. And it's also an uneconomic cost because uh, uh, this should have been done at the time the coal was mined and should have been charged as part of the cost of the mining. Uh, so I fear this will have a very low priority, that it will not be done uh, uh, in, in the near future. And the result is that we're going to be denied the use and benefit of these lands for recreation as watershed lands uh, and for the contribution that they can make to the country. I've probably seen as much of this nation from a helicopter the last six or eight years as anybody, and that's the best way to see it, because you see the beauty, you see the scars, you see the damage. And of course, there's, there's no uh, damage to the land that uh, is more permanent and uh, really more devastating than uh, what you see in the worst strip mining areas in the United States. The reason this is, uh, is damaging is that if uh, action is not taken to uh, restore these stripped areas, uh, they're left there. They can't revegetate themselves. At least it'll take uh, many, many uh, tens or hundreds of years for anything to occur. And that uh, these become sort of permanent man-made wastelands. 
and we have too many uh, too many people we have too many things that we need to do with our land too much need for outdoor recreation and playgrounds we can't afford to have wastelands created by man in this country and this is the reason that uh, i think all of us have to regret the mistakes of the past and we have to determine that we're not going to repeat those mistakes now what we have done we have done and nothing will change that what we must do now is learn to mine not minerals but the mind of man and from it to extract that most precious of all our planet's resources human awareness the importance of that task was eloquently stated by the late adlai stevenson during his last address to the united nations we travel together passengers on a little spaceship dependent on its vulnerable supplies of air soil and water preserved from annihilation only by the care the work and i will say the love we give our fragile craft